I hope you brought a Bible. Blessed uh, time of worship this morning. Just sense the presence of the Lord. Powerful. I'd like for you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Jonah. I've got a message on revival today. I want to, I want to speak on the great Nineveh revival. You know, America has a history of revivals. Uh, we haven't had one in a while, however. And we definitely need a real revival, a real move of God. You know, our whole earth is, uh, is very tense right now with uh, the tensions uh, with North Korea. You know, the, the problems in Syria. Now you've got Israel raiding across the border and bombing targets in Syria, especially to take out weapons that are headed for Hezbollah. Uh, we know that Iran backs Syria and Hezbollah. The tensions are very heightened there. We know that now Turkey is on alert because they're not too happy with the United States either going across the Syrian border. Um, world tensions are escalating everywhere. Uh, we, we know that Russia is unpredictable. China is unpredictable. North Korea is definitely unpredictable. And the fellow who's in charge there is not in his right mind. And he doesn't mind annihilating his own country. Uh, he, he has no regard for human life whatsoever. So never, I, I don't think the, the capability, never before has the world been so capable of destroying itself. Uh, so many renegade countries do have nuclear capability, whether you're talking about Pakistan, not exactly a stable government. Uh, and North Korea, so it, it's a time for prayer. It's a time to look up. It's uh, not a time to be silly and to uh, and flirt with the world. And And if it's ever been a time for a real move of God, I believe we need to pray. That for God to move. The first real awakening in America came back in the 1700s, way back 1734, 1735, 1736, when a great revival broke out in the colonies and uh, powerful men of God were used, men like George Whitefield, men like John and Charles Wesley, to bring a powerful revival that really shook the young people. Uh, the, the colonies. Uh, this was before America was even a nation. You know, we, before we were an independent nation, God was moving powerfully back in, in those days and, and doing wonderful things back then. God brought great repentance and great salvation. Uh, the second great awakening lasted about 40 years. It was born in a city, uh, actually a small town in Kentucky, and spread all over. Revivals broke out all over the United States. This was a time when Charles Finney was greatly being used of the Lord. Revivals just sprung up all over the United States. This was back in the early 1800s, lasted till about 1840. There was the businessman's revival. I spoke about this before uh, with uh, Jeremiah Lampierre, the New York businessman who... It was called the Great Prayer Meeting Revival. If you remember, it was born in a prayer meeting among laymen when God began to just break out in revival all across uh, the northeast part of the United States. And a million people came to Christ. And not only that, but in that particular revival, a million church members got saved. They said one out of every four. Church members, these were people that were attending church, weren't even saved, but attending church. I mean, God was moving powerfully back then. There was a revival that moved, believe it or not, during the Civil War among the soldiers. Hundreds of thousands were saved, both among the Confederate and Union troops. God moved then. Uh, there were the urban revivals also in the 1800s, the late 1800s. These, uh, you, you read of men like D.L. Moody and others that God used in that powerful time in America's history. The Welsh revival that broke out 
among the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Welsh immigrants that spread and affected hundreds of thousands of people. You've heard of people like Billy Sunday. Uh, God uh, raised him up during those times of the Welsh revivals. And you've heard of the Azusa Street revivals and so forth that started back in the 1900s that uh, ushered in a, a whole new wave of Pentecostal experience for multitudes of people. But, but I want us to read today about probably the greatest revival that ever happened in human history. And it happened in an unlikely place. The catalyst was an unlikely prophet. And the message he preached was a highly unlikely message. And God moved in a way that has been unprecedented. We've never seen anything like it before or since. And if you're in the book of Jonah, I want to read beginning in chapter 3 and verse 1 about the great Nineveh revival. Jonah 3 verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For a word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. He laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not eat nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger? that we perish not. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Fascinating passage of, of the greatest revival recorded anywhere in the Bible, and actually the greatest anywhere, I believe, in human history. It broke out in the unlikeliest of places, Nineveh of all places, the capital city of Assyria. The Assyrians were a violent people, a vile people, a vicious, cruel people. That's what they were known for, their cruelty. They were a people wholly given over to idolatry. They were worshippers of the fish god Dagon. They were worshippers of Ishtar, the fertility goddess. They were a people without spiritual discernment, a people without mercy, a people without moral conviction. To say they were an unlikely city where revival would break out would be a, a, a great understatement. And to expect God to move in the way that he did in a city like this is astonishing. Uh, Nineveh, we read, was a great city, a huge city. It, Today, it, it would have been located in present-day Iraq, but it was huge, especially by ancient standards. Let me just uh, point back, look back to this passage in uh, chapter 3, where the Lord said, verse 2, Go to Nineveh, that great city. And it goes on and tells us that Nineveh was an exceeding great city, verse 3 of three days journey exceeding great in fact historians tell us it was the largest city in the world at the time in, in that part of the world the largest of its kind it was enormous there were walls around the city uh, John Wesley 
said that the city had 60 miles of gigantic walls around it, that the, hard to believe, but that the walls were 100 feet high, and you could run three chariots side by side across the top of them, that the towers were 1,500 in number around the walls, and that they were up to 200 feet high, that uh, this would make for an enormous city, that it would take you three days if you traveled 20 miles a day, which is what they figured the average person could walk, it would take you three days to encompass the city, walking around the 60 mile walls, 60 miles of walls. So we're talking about an enormous uh, city by any standard. If you, if you look with me to chapter 4, I want to show you another passage over here. It talks about the population of the city. Chapter 4 and verse 11 says, Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also many cattle. Six score thousand persons. The... the uh, most of your commentaries and historians and scholars and so forth will say that that equals 120,000 people, that it was a city of 120,000. Here's the interesting thing. Your scholars are about equally divided as to whether that 120,000 comprises the population who simply were a people without discernment or whether that's the number of children in the city. 120,000, it says, that can't discern between their right hand and their left hand, which many say that means there was 120,000 children, young children, in the city. And if you figure that generally children comprise about one-fifth of a population, it would mean that Nineveh could possibly have had a population of 600,000 people or more, maybe as many as 700,000. However many it is, it was an enormous city by any standard, but especially in the standard of the ancient world. And if indeed chapter 4 and verse 11 indicates 120,000 children, it would help us to understand why God would be concerned and want to spare the city and not annihilate it, not erase it from off the earth uh, because of its wickedness, because of this vast amount of children. But, uh, by the way, this nation, Assyria, was Israel's great enemy. And Nineveh was their capital, the capital city of Israel's great enemy, and there was no love lost between them. Uh, God chose to send revival to an unlikely place, to be sure, uh, using an unlikely prophet. In fact, the most unlikely prophet of all, because Jonah didn't even want to go. And, and if you'll bear with me a little bit, I'd like for you to turn back to chapter 1 quickly. And I know most of you are familiar with the account of Jonah you learn it when you're a kid in Sunday school, Jonah and the whale, actually Jonah and the great fish. Perhaps it was a whale, but Jonah and the great fish. In the first two chapters of this book, you know, it's all about how Jonah ran from God and ran from this call. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He, he wouldn't want to go there no more than you or I would want to go to Syria or... Iran or Iraq and preach, preach to them. Because you know if you go there, you're likely not coming back, for one thing. I mean, you, it would be a one-way trip. But God called him, chapter 1, verse 1, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Go preach to Nineveh. Jonah went right out, got on a ship to Tarshish, and went 2,000 miles in the opposite direction. The last thing he wanted to do was go preach in Nineveh. 
And I don't believe it was because he was afraid. I don't believe that for a minute. But you know when there is an enemy of your nation, an enemy that has terrorized, murdered, captured cities, decapitated people that you know. I mean, the, the Assyrians were a vicious, cruel, violent people. They, they enjoyed piling up human heads just to terrorize a population. didn't matter if it was men, women, or children. These were vicious people. The last thing Jonah wanted to do was go preach over there. Again, I don't think it was because he was worried about his own head. I don't believe he wanted God to have mercy on him. He's not what you would call a preacher who was burdened for the souls of those he was called to preach to. At least not in that particular case. So he got on a ship headed in the opposite direction and God interrupted his trip, as you know. The Bible says, verse 4, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. There was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Such a great storm that the ship, the wooden ship was breaking. It would have broken apart. Uh, you can read the account. It's a very interesting account. These old uh, salts of the sea, these old sailors who were accustomed to sailing in every kind of storm were terrified at, at this particular, the, the ferocity, the intensity of this particular storm. The fact that it must have arisen out of nowhere led them to believe this is no normal storm. Something is going on here. You know, Jonah comes out and he confesses, look, I'm a servant of God. I'm actually running from him right now. And the reason why you're going through this is because of me. And if you want to get free from this storm, if you want to see the, calm, the, the, the seas restored to calm, you've got to throw me overboard. Now they were really afraid. They didn't want to do that. Uh, but they didn't want to die either. So guess what? Feeling one. If we get rid of him, we live. If he dies, that's his problem. So that's what they did. They threw him overboard. They tried not to. In fact, they said, they cried to the Lord. They said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's sake. And lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, has done as it pleased thee. They took up Jonah, they threw him into the sea, and the sea became calm. Then they feared the Lord, verse 16 says, and they offered a sacrifice and made vows. So now Jonah's in the middle of the sea, but don't worry, the Lord sent some transportation for him. <laughs> you just never know what a fish might bite on. I, I learned that a long time ago. Sometimes you've got to have live bait. You can throw plastic sometimes all you want, but sometimes you, gotta, you just got to have live bait for the fish to bite. At this particular occasion, what this fish needed was a reluctant prophet. And you know the account, the whale, the great fish, swallowed Jonah, verse 17, chapter 117. It swallowed up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Skeptics tell us that this was impossible that this could not happen, that uh, the account of Jonah and the great fish is mythological, it's a fable, it's a fabrication, because it's impossible for a person to live inside of any kind of a whale, fish, whatever, for three days and three nights. It couldn't have happened. Well, it's also impossible for somebody to be dead and in the grave for three days and three nights and then rise from the grave. That's also impossible. And the Lord himself compared himself to Jonah. In fact, he said in Matthew 12, verse 39, when they said, when the people were saying to the Pharisees, show us a sign, we want to see a sign. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but there shall no sign be given it Except for the sign of the prophet Jonah, the Lord himself, 
acknowledged the validity of what happened to Jonah. He said the sign of Jonah, and it was a sign because it was a miracle. You can't live like that. You can't live in a fish's belly for three days and three nights. He said, and just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. Of course, they were kind of mystified, didn't really know what he was talking about, but the Lord said it was a sign, that what happened to Jonah was a sign. That is, it was a miracle. So we take it literally. If you believe the Bible, you take it literally. The Bible is not a book of myths and fables and fairy tales. But, and what's impossible for men, well, it's no problem for God. And you get to chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, Then Jonah prayed. Yeah, he prayed then. He might not have stopped and prayed before, but he prayed now. In the belly of the whale, Jonah prayed. When, you couldn't run, when he couldn't run no further, then he prayed. When you couldn't get no further away from God... Sometimes that's what it takes before people will, will actually humble themselves and pray. The good thing is that God didn't kill Jonah. Uh, God didn't even abandon Jonah. He didn't wipe his hands of Jonah, wash his hands and just say, I'm done with you. I, I, I'll never use you again. In, in fact, just the opposite. God renewed his call. But that's just God's amazing grace. You know, he's the God of second chances. Third chances, fourth chances. Amazing grace. Then Jonah prayed when his back was against the wall. In, in his great distress, the Bible says, verse 2, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. And thou heardest my voice. Reminds me, it really reminds me of the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son who took all of his inheritance and fled and uh, spent everything he had on riotous living. He had, he had friends as long as he had money, but when he ran out of money, he ran out of friends. And then he found himself in a pig pen wrestling with, pen, with pigs for the husks of uh, rotting food. And the Bible says he came to himself. Sometimes you've got to have your back against the wall before you come to yourself. Sometimes you have to be, he said, in the midst of my distress, in the midst of my affliction, sometimes it's not till your back's against the wall that people cry out to God. We see this happen frequently. When a, per, a person has to get all the way to rock bottom before they'll call out to God and stop running. Then Jonah prayed. He was like that prodigal son. He didn't stop to pray until God stopped him from running any further. Swallowed him by a great whale. And every time I read it, I think about what is it going to take to get some people to stop running from God? I mean, really and truly, what's it going to take to get them to stop running? Because there are people who know better. Jonah knew better than this. He knew better. He knew better than to run from God. And yet, that's exactly what he did. Sometimes we let our flesh get the best of us. We let our emotions get the best of us. We let our attitude, our anger, our biases, our resentments, our prejudices get the best of us. Stuff that should have been crucified long ago. You can't hate people. You can't hate na nationalities. Jonah is not supposed to hate the Assyrians just because they're Assyrians. They're lost people. And we can't hate people either. None of us. Here's what he said in verse 2. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. The King James translates it the belly of hell. And I'm sure it seemed like hell in, a, in the belly of a whale. And here's what the Bible says. And thou heardest my voice. God heard his prayer from the belly of a fish. So certainly he'll hear our prayer because I don't believe uh, our distress is quite as 
difficult as Jonah's was at the time, you know, the Lord is a very present help in trouble. I know that sometimes we're tempted to think that the Lord doesn't hear us. You may go through things, difficult times. You may think, where's God in all this? He's, he's absent. Look at verse 7, chapter 2, verse 7. It says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. I think that's a very powerful verse itself. That means God not only heard the prophet's prayer, but you know, prayer goes right before the Lord, right into the sacred precincts. There are no intermediaries. Jonah's not crying out to some saint or some dead ancestor. He's crying out to the Lord, and his prayer goes directly into the precincts of God. We call out, to our God, we have our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in His name. We pray in no other name. We pray to none other. When my soul fainted, I remembered the Lord. In our distress, we can call upon God and He will hear. Look, He'll hear you. He'll hear you. <laughs> And I don't think I could emphasize more the fact that Jonah's circumstances were impossible. You talk about impossible circumstances, he's beyond rescue. Who's going to come help him? Not only was he in this great storm out in the middle of a sea where he was tossed overboard and lost, but now he's swallowed by a whale and brought down to the bottom of the ocean. Who's coming to rescue Jonah? His situation is beyond hopeless. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. We serve a God to whom nothing's impossible. But here's a man beyond rescue. He is beyond rescue. He is beyond help and beyond hope except for God. Only God can help him now. Only God can help him now. So... Let's let this be encouraging to us because sometimes we find ourselves in difficult situations and we can't figure our way out of it. Look, we serve a God of the impossible. He's the one we call upon. He's the one we pray to. Our prayers, too, will go before His sacred precincts right into the temple of the Lord, right into the presence of the Lord. He will hear your prayer, my prayer. He's a present help in time of trouble. He hasn't run out of miracles. He can still intervene. He can still make a, a way when things seem impossible. Look, our circumstances are not impossible. They only seem that way. Sometimes to us we let, we let them loom large in our mind and we forget that we serve a God who promises to deliver, to heal, to protect, to provide. Then Jonah prayed, and God gave him a second chance. Verse 10, chapter 2, verse 10, the Lord spoke unto the fish. And it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. There's been times I've asked the Lord to speak to the fish. I I have to admit that. Not to come bite me or, you know, but at least bite this hook that, you know. Lord, would you speak to these fish? (laughs) Well, look. Then, chapter 3, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Okay, so here's, the Lord says, All right, Jonah, let's try this again. Get up and go to Nineveh. Now, you didn't listen the first time. Here's your second chance. Guess what Jonah did? He went to Nineveh. He wasn't about to waste his second chance. And I believe it'd be wise if we didn't waste ours as well. The blessed thing is we serve a God who forgives. uh, And God gave him the opportunity to do what he should have done in the first place. 
He said, get up, go to Nineveh. So he did. He got up, he went to Nineveh, and there broke out the most extraordinary revival the world has ever seen, as we have read in chapter 3. Jonah arose, verse 3, chapter 3. He went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, nothing like this has ever been seen or heard because verse 5 says, The people of Nineveh believed God. And look at this. They not only believed God, they proclaimed the fast, they put on sackcloth, from the greatest even to the least of them. The king himself arose from his throne. Now, when he gets up from his throne, the indication here is he now means business. Because, you know, the king, he, he sits on a throne, he's the king. But now he gets up from his throne. The Bible says he laid his robe from him. He's humbling himself, taking off all of his royal regalia and array, putting this down. The Bible says he covered him with sackcloth. This is what they wore when they were grieved and repentant and broken. And he sat in ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king. Everybody fasts. Everybody, even the cattle fasts, because we're in trouble. He said, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. We're talking repentance here. Genuine repentance. A citywide revival. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? Not that God repents, because God doesn't do anything wrong. But when people repent, God will relent. You see, God will judge sin. Now, if people quit sinning, God will relent. But unless they repent, He will not relent. He's going to judge sin. So... The mystery of it all, the mystery of this great revival is that it's contrary to everything we know and everything we think. Jonah, a reluctant prophet, sent to speak in a city that he really didn't want to see repent, a pagan city, one given completely over to idolatry. He had no burden for these people, no love for these people, not really. He preached a very harsh message. In fact, it was 100% a message of divine wrath and judgment. There was no love in his message. He didn't go tell them, Nineveh, God has a wonderful plan for your life. That's not what he said. He didn't bring them a book that said, this is going to be your best life. But he did not go with that kind of message. He did not go with a big smile and a happy God loves you. And Let me tell you what his message was. God hates you, and in 40 days, he's going to erase you from this planet. 40 days, that's all you've got, and you're all dead. Nineveh, you're all dead. That's his message. Every one of you, for your wickedness, for your violence, you know that's what he said, because in verse 8, the king said, Let's turn away from our evil ways. He said, let's turn away from the violence. And maybe God will relent. The whole city repented. This is so contrary to everything we've been taught. Because his message was the single most seeker, unfriendly message in history. God hates you. And he's going to kill all of you. You've got 40 days. That's it. 40 days. Jonah did not perform any miracles. He did not part the waters. Did not call fire down from heaven. He did not heal the sick. He did not multiply food. He did not cast out devils. He stilled no storms. 
And the whole city repented. When you think about it, even though the Lord himself compared himself to Jonah in the sense, you know, three days in the belly of the earth, three days in the belly of the whale, no, Jonah was really unlike the Lord in, in every other way. Uh, the Lord came to his own people, the Bible said, and his own received him not. He came to the Jews that he loved and he cared about. He cared about those people. He wept over them, right? He preached to them for three years. He worked miracles in their midst. He healed their sick. He cast out the demons. He multiplied food and performed many signs and wonders in front of them. He was perfect. The Lord was sinless in all of his ways. And he preached to them for three years. And you know what? The Bible says they did not repent. Amen. They did not repent. In fact, this is what the Lord himself said in Matthew 12 and verse 41. Listen to this. The men of Nineveh. Now this is what the Lord's telling the Jews. The men of Nineveh will rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. They repented. Nineveh will stand up on Judgment Day and witness and testify against the Jews. They'll witness against them, they'll testify against them because Jonah preached to Nineveh and they repented. Someone greater than Jonah has come to preach to you and you've not repented. So, there'll be no excuse, right? No excuse whatsoever. God has sent revivals before, but never a revival quite like this. I, I do pray that the Lord will send at least one more great revival before the end comes. I can't help but think that the end is is on its way, but we have no promise. We do have a promise that there will be a great end-time apostasy. Our prayer is that God will also send at least revival fire one more time. I, I do want us to realize, at, you know, in reading these passages, that, you know, revival is not something that you can manufacture. You can't hype it up. You can't work it up. Uh, no amount of smoke machines and uh, strobe lights is going to manufacture revival. No amount of human effort is going to manufacture revival. We do know that we need to pray that God would send revival. Because it is a sovereign move and a sovereign act of God. Some of the things that I think have gone by the name of revival in America have been far from it. Not long ago, there was what they called the gold dust revival. I don't know if some of y'all heard about that. Where supposedly gold dust was falling on people during church services. Of course, when people collected what was supposed to be gold dust, they found out it was plastic confetti. Uh, and then there was the laughing revival uh, that, you know, hey, can I tell you something? There wasn't nobody laughing in Nineveh. The message that brought revival to Nineveh was a message of divine wrath and judgment. In fact, when you read the writings of men like Whitfield, uh, Spurgeon, the Wesleys. You know one of the things that was a significant part of their emphasis? The impending judgment of God. They preached on divine judgment coming upon a nation and upon a people. They preached on the fact that we are here very, a very short period of time and then we must stand before God and give an account for our life. They, this was a major part of their preaching. And multitudes of people were saved. Multitudes of people repented of sin. It brought such powerful conviction 
that it transformed lives and changed them forever. Let's, let's notice just a couple of quick things here today before we quit. I want you to notice that it was God who sent this messenger. It was God who sent Jonah. Chapter 1, chapter 3, God said, Jonah, you go preach in that city. Jonah didn't send himself. Jonah didn't even volunteer. But Jonah was a prophet, and he was God's prophet. And even though he allowed himself to listen to his own bias and his own flesh, and he went the wrong direction, he was still a godly man. God sent him. He didn't send himself. I think it's important that we know that even though Jonah was a reluctant prophet, he was still a godly prophet and still a godly man. And he obeyed God and he went despite how he felt. Sometimes we have to do what we're supposed to do despite how we feel. Sometimes you have to forgive people when you don't feel like forgiving them. But you do what you're supposed to do. You forgive. You choose to forgive. It's your choice. You know, it's not an emotion or a feeling. You choose. I choose by an act of my will to forgive. I forgive. I, I, I let it go. Lord, give me the grace. I let it go. I choose to let it go. You have to choose to get up and come to church on a rainy day. I mean, the flesh might say, hey, it's a good day to sleep in. But uh, we, we make choices that sometimes are contrary to the way we feel. We do it because we're supposed to, because we're supposed to be responsible. Not long ago, a, a, a fellow told me that God had called him to the ministry and, and called him to be a pastor. Now, generally I would say, praise God, that's great, brother. God bless you. I'll pray for you. <laughs> uh, but this particular fellow... I happened to know was living with his girlfriend, and they're not married. So, so I had to talk to him, and I had to talk straight to him about, uh, look, God may use a reluctant prophet, but he's not going to use an unclean one. There's some things you've got to get right with God. If he's called you, then you better get right quick. You don't, go, don't you take it upon yourself to go doing something in an unclean state, because God's not going to bless that. The first, first and foremost God calls us to do is to repent and be right with Him. Before He can use us, we must repent and be right with God. Then, I want us to notice, not only did God send the messenger, but God gave him the message. He said, chapter 3 Verse 2, you preach to Nineveh the message that I give you. I'll give you the message. You preach that message. I believe that's important too. That we, wh whoever we are, whatever we share, that we share God's message and that we not look to get a message from a can, uh, or borrow our message from the first church of Nineveh. You know, they have a very big church there. And it's, uh, it's growing by leaps and bounds. They have PowerPoints that you can buy. and It just tells you how you can succeed in life. And Jonah's message was very simple, very clear. Everybody could understand it. Very bold. And God gave it to him. And the message was, you're all going to be dead in 40 days. That's it. God is coming, and he's not happy with you. So you got about 40 days, and then Nineveh will be no more. I mean, Jonah did everything wrong. When you think about it, how are you going to reach a city? I mean, there were no Nineveh for Jesus t-shirts or nothing. He wasn't doing any of those. Things. He did everything wrong. No billboards with his picture on it, you know. Unlikely prophet in an unlikely city with an unlikely message. 
highly unlikely that he'd see any results and revival broke out. That just tells you it's a sovereign thing when God sends revival. He preaches this message and they all repented. From the top down. Verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed God. That's what it takes. That's what we need. Simple declaration of God's message and for people once again to believe God. I don't know what it will take. But they prayed, maybe God will have mercy. Jonah didn't even offer to pray for him. He just proclaimed judgment, and they repented. Unprecedented. All the great revival preachers that you've ever read about, whether it was Whitfield or Moody or Wesley or Finney or Billy Graham, Billy Sunday, None of them saw anything like this. Nothing like it. The greatest revival in history happened when a short message on God's impending judgment was preached by a prophet who didn't even want to be there. This, this revival, by the way, appeared to have results not just for a year or five or ten, but for decades. In fact, that entire generation was spared God's wrath. Eventually, judgment came, you know. Judgment came to Nineveh, eventually. By the time you get to the prophet Nahum, he's calling Nineveh, again, a bloody city. He said, woe to the bloody city. It's full of lies and robbery. He says, it'll, it'll come to pass that those that look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Nahum chapter 3 and verse 7. Nahum announced judgment. That judgment later came uh, when the Medes destroyed the city, 612 B.C. But you know, from the time of Jonah's revival to the time of Nineveh's destruction, it was almost 150 years. That's incredible. Almost 150 years. It, it tells us that a true move of God can have a long-lasting effect. But you know, each generation has to have its own experience with God. Each generation. You, we can't survive over the Azusa Street revival from the 1900s. That's, we can't survive off. We can't survive off the Great Awakening from... 200 years ago. We, we need a move of God in our generation. We need to experience God in our life and in our, in our time. But revival, as desperately as it's needed, it only affects the generation uh, that experiences it. The trickle-down effect can last for generations later, but each generation has to have its own experience with God. It's not enough that your mama was saved or that your grandfather was a, a good man or a godly man or that your grandmother prayed for you. That's a great thing, but that's not enough. You yourself need to know the Lord and to call upon him for mercy and forgiveness. Here's what he says. Look, and here's the nature of real repentance. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Let them cry mightily unto God. Let them turn from their evil ways and the violence that is in their hands. So they didn't just believe in God. They believed and they changed their ways. That's what revival is. You know, that's what repentance is. You turn around. You don't keep doing the same old thing. Some people have this easy believism. Well, I believe in Jesus. Raise your hand if you believe in Jesus. Well, I believe in Jesus. But they don't change their ways. Nothing changes in their life. Here's what he said. Let's change our evil ways and maybe God will have mercy. And God did. God has mercy. He's a merciful God. If he would have mercy on Nineveh, 
then how much more will he have mercy on you and I? If we will ask him, if we will turn from our ways, if we'll cease from our running from God, if we will stop our disobedience and rebellion. Let's not wait till we're in the belly of a whale to pray. Let's pray while, while we still can. And ask the Lord to have mercy on us. And you know he will. He always will. He didn't tell Nineveh, you're so far gone that there's no forgiveness for you. He didn't tell him that. And he won't tell you that either. If you've never called on the Lord for mercy, would you do it today? Would you ask him, Lord Jesus, have mercy on my soul. Lord Jesus, I confess my sins. I am a sinful man, sinful woman. And I ask for your forgiveness. Lord, I choose to turn from my ways, my evil ways. And I want to follow you. Help me to live my life for you. This I pray in Jesus' name. He's a God whose mercies never fail. Amen. Amen. His mercies never fail. Well, it gives us an idea about the nature of uh, revival. God has to send it. We can't make it up. We can't make it happen. But let, let me tell you what we can do. We can pray. And we, we need to pray. We must pray. Lord, send revival to America. Send it to our nation. Send it to our city. Send it to our church. Send it to me. Make it personal. Lord Jesus, send revival. Send revival fire, we pray. To our nation, our broken nation, our divided nation, send revival, Lord. Only you can heal us. Lord, send revival to this city, this broken, divided city, laden with crime and evil of every kind, corruption across the land. Lord Jesus, we need you. Send revival. We are a vulnerable city, Lord, vulnerable to the forces of nature. We need you, Lord. Send revival. Lord, send revival to us personally and individually. Help us, Lord, to be changed and transformed and, and help us, Lord, to to then affect others, we pray. We need you, Lord. We need you to move, Lord. We ask for it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen.